What's going on everybody? It's Joseph Sadar here. I pray that you all are doing amazing and wonderful. Guys, I have a uh, I have a global word today and it's crazy, man. It, it's been an exhausting word, but it, it's it's a very important word and it's a it's an end times message word and it's about the battle of the two kingdoms. But specifically, I'm supposed to go over the role and the battle plan of each kingdom in these last days. If this word is also supposed to present itself as an ultimatum for uh, for people um, who are going to end up choosing which side of this battle they're going to be on. So please watch into the end. It's, it's, a, it's a lengthy word, but I know this is how God wanted me to share it. He just kind of wanted me to share it all at once. And um, yeah, but it, it's going to be good. And this is this this is from the Lord. So it's for somebody. So I'm going to jump on in. But I'm going to start with a brief preface and it's to eliminate any stumbling block to receiving the word and it's also to know that there is only one God and it is the God of the Bible so I'm going to read this this preface really fast it's very important God is responsible for the creation of the earth and all that you see around you for all my atheists and non-Christian friends the big bang theory is not how creation was formed nor do human beings evolve from apes there is absolutely zero tangible and demonstrable evidence for any of these claims. Anything apart from the Genesis uh, creation story cannot be tested. Therefore, it is fallacy. You can, however, test these accounts, not just only in Genesis, but also for the rest of the Bible. For centuries, there have been many archaeological findings, such as new uh, Newsy tablets, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, manuscripts from secular historians, and old tablets that confirm the events of the Old and New Testament. Now, exploring these pieces of evidence is another video for another day, but in the meantime, I encourage everyone to watch uh, the movie, The Case for Christ. It's a great resource uh, that proves the, the um, historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and therefore proving Christianity. It's on Netflix. So, guys, I had to read it. I had to get that out the way, um, because, yeah, you just have to know that that God is real and everything I'm about to say is real. So I'm going to jump into it now. Um, I'm going to start with the kingdom of darkness, which is led by Satan. And yeah, with that, I'm going to get started. So when Lucifer was betrayed, when Lucifer betrayed the kingdom of God, when he battled God in heaven and he convinced a third of the angels to fight God, Satan was cast down. He, he was cast down from heaven, but he didn't go alone. Like I said, he took the angels with him and he convinced the angels of something. He convinced the angels that God somehow was just not good or, or there's, there's something that Satan could do better. So after this, God would eventually create the first humans, Adam and Eve, and he would give them reign and dominion over the earth. He also created them for intimate fellowship with himself. Everything was good. And because of the evil in Lucifer, God's only restriction on Adam and Eve was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned them that they would surely die. Now, Lucifer, Satan, or the devil at this point, he was on the prowl. And his next mission was to take that authority, that dominion, and that kingdom away from Adam and Eve. Uh, Satan was planning to advance his kingdom on earth. He would implement the same tactics he used with the angels, and he would convince Adam and Eve that God was not worthy of his throne. And Satan essentially, he targeted Eve, and he pretty much got her to dethrone God in her own heart. You know, he convinced her that somehow that God just wasn't good. I imagine the same tactics he used for the angels he he used for um he used for Eve. And Eve actually fell right into it. She believed that God was holding back on her. So she did end up eating the fruit, and Adam didn't stop it, so he ate the fruit either. You know, most of you are familiar with the story. But here's the thing: what Satan didn't tell Eve is that if she had eaten this fruit, that she was going to give all of her reign, all of her dominion, and all of her power over to Satan. Her and Adam ruled the earth, but she, but he didn't tell her 
that she would be turning all that over to him. And this is exactly when they ate of the fruit. This is exactly when Satan became the ruler of this earth. It's important to know when we're talking about the kingdom of darkness. We are talking about his kingdom here on earth. Yes. I know it's a shocker for some because there's some people that believe that that um, God, that God is actually the ruler of this earth. And he's actually not. I mean, he's still sovereign. He's still all powerful, but he's actually not the ruler. He's coming back to take back his rule here on earth. But as of right now, God, the, the devil is actually the ruler of this earth. We see this in passages of scripture like 1 John 5, 19, John 12, 31, that the ruler of this world is the evil one. Even Jesus himself says it when he's put on trial by Pontius Pilate, you know, and he and he, he says just straight up that my kingdom is not of this world. And what's my point in saying all this? Pretty much the devil has been on the same mission ever since. His mission in the kingdom of darkness has been to conform the world to his image. We're going to talk a little bit about like the, the image of the beast and, and the market of the beast in a little bit. But his mission was to ascend his throne above God's and to make his throne above the most high. He's a counterfeit. So since Adam and Eve, all he's done throughout history is deceive humanity in the same way. All the, all the evil in this world is a result of the devil's greatest lie. And it's that you can live apart from God and you can live however you please. You can dethrone God like he convinced Eve to do it to um, God you can, and you can live however you please. Hitler believed in the survival of the fittest and he killed numerous amount of Jews. You think God intended for the Holocaust to happen or did Satan's kingdom persuade him to enhance himself and enhance his ideology? Aleister Crawley was a famous English occultist and magician. He dabbled in the dark arts. He, um, his famous phrase that he coined is, do as thou wilt, which is pretty much do whatever you want and there's no line to cross. That is exactly what it means to pretty much live life however you want to live it. And that's that's not God. That's all Satan. That's actually the religion of Satan to do, to do as you will. Um, now, the important question for us today, what is Satan's last battle plan? What is Satan's last battle plan in these last days? I'm going to be, I'm going to read a scripture and we kind of see this in Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Matthew 4, 8 through 10 reads, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord God, and him only shall you serve. Guys, the devil's last plan of attack is to get as many people to bow down and worship him as possible. His image, his image, pretty much, his image of the beast specifically. And so here's where it gets confusing because worshiping Satan doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're having to bow down and worship a guy with like, you know, uh, horns and a pitchfork and a tail. No. <sighs> Worshiping Satan actually really means just living your life apart from Christ in any way. In any way that is not of Christ is of the devil. That is worshiping uh, Satan. And we're going to see where exactly Satan and his kingdom ends up. Because, like I said, I repeat, if you're not worshiping Jesus, you are a pawn in Satan's battle plan in some way. From Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, we see that Satan owns all the kingdoms of this world. That is the only reason he was able to offer Jesus all this wealth. Uh, he's He was doing it in that time, and he's still doing it today because he is the ruler of this earth right now. Now, he can't touch God's people without God's permission. You know, God, like I said before, God is still sovereign and he, he's omnipotent, but there, and there's certain boundaries that he has in place, but Satan is still allowed to rule this earth. So I propose a question, and this is a case, and why is it so controversial for people to believe that people are selling their souls for fame and fortune today? Is it not scriptural? 
That's exactly what Satan tried to get Jesus to do. Pretty much to sell his soul for all the fame and, and the wealth in the world. He said he'll give them all the kingdoms of the world. The devil is gathering his kingdom on earth in these last days for that final battle against the Most High God. The goal is to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Some of you are familiar with the concept of one world government or new world order. It's a very ancient concept. There's some of you who still want to believe that it's just a conspiracy. Guys, it's not a conspiracy. It's, it's actually very, very real and it's very, very scriptural. The UN's goal is to try to find ways to bring about this global governance. And President JFK warned us about these secret societies. And for those of you living in America, our nation was not founded by Christians. I know there's still a lot of people that believe that, but it was actually founded by Freemasons that were worshiping the Luciferian agenda. And like I said before, the God of this world is Lucifer. So it makes sense. I'm not making this up. Like this, this, this is all scriptures in the Bible. And the reason why it's so important for especially Christians to understand this is because there's still so many of you that put your faith and your trust in the things of this world. And there's still so many of you that put your, your trust in the leaders of this world specifically. Like, I mean, it amazes me like every election year, just how so many Christians make their Lord and Savior the voting booth. I mean, it's like, it's like the spell that people come under. It, it, it's, it's very, it's very weird. It's like this candidate is, is going to fix all of, all of your problems. And it's just like, guys, honestly, at this point, if, if you don't understand that these politicians are not going to fix all your problems, you're, <laughs> you'll, you'll be waiting. You'll, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be in real big trouble because yeah, it is, it's just, that's just not how it's going to go. When we get to the core of everything, we know that Satan has plans politically. All those politicians, a lot of them are part of the elite. So I'm not telling anyone not to vote, but it's wise to take all that election energy, you know, each election year and, and, and take all that energy and focus on the Holy Spirit and praying for the nation. And yeah, and this this isn't an election video. I'm not I'm not trying to get political here, but specifically the devil wants to unite the world in order to worship the beast and receive the image of the beast. Now we're getting back into uh, the mark of the beast. In the last days, this is this final plot to this great battle. And here's an interesting thing about the beast. It's going to be a very, very marvelous, very, very marvelous sighting because he's going to be able to do signs, wonders, and miracles. And a lot of people are going to be fooled by this beast. And a lot of people are going to worship this beast. In Revelations 13, 13 through 18, I'm not going to read the verse, but it talks all about how people are going to worship, worship this, this antichrist figure. And, but what does that look like really, like even in your day-to-day -day life right now? Because unless you're a de unless you're an avid devil worshiper, you're not going to just be praising the devil like you know, like I said, the 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 pitchforks and the tail, and you know the tail guy. But if you're not devoted to Jesus Christ, my biggest point is that you are being conditioned to accept the mark of the beast. You're being conditioned to accept that that image of the beast. Um, it says, and also it's funny because it says. In the, in the passage of scripture that anyone who does not worship the beast will be slain. I mean, if you don't have Christ's protection, you're just going to be straight up slain if you reject the image of the beast. However, that looks like, you know, when those days come, if you don't receive it on your hand or your forehead, you will not be able to buy or sell without it. So, and again, like I said, there's going to be many that are going to be amazed and fooled by this beat, beast. It's going to be a devilish being. It's going to be like this antichrist figure. It's going to be charismatic. Now, I'm going to wrap up Satan's part of the kingdom by telling you what happens in the end. So if you skip over to Revelation chapter 14, 9 through 12, I'm going to read this. It says, And another angel, a third, followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these scriptures apply to this present moment as well, because if you die today without Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you died, you would be judged by God and you would be sent to eternal to eternal torture with the beast. And pretty much there you have it. That There's no happy ending for the uh, kingdom of darkness specifically. History will just repeat itself. Satan will gather an army to fight God. And even, unfortunately, some of the very elect will be deceived. But at that final battle, he will lose and be sent into the lake of fire forever forever. And all those who followed him, all those who didn't believe in Jesus, they will also be sent to the lake of fire forever. The wages of sin is death. So the kingdom of darkness is crushed by the kingdom of God. Now there's hope because now it's time to talk about the winning side of this battle. And next part of this message, I'm going to go over the battle plan for the kingdom of God. I'm going to go over the role it plays. And but first, what is the kingdom of God? It's a realm of justice, purity, righteousness, perfection, riches, love. It's a realm of unparalleled power, abundance, peace, joy and victory. That is the kingdom of God. And it's automatically a losing battle for Satan from the start. That's it. The, the plan of the kingdom of God is to restore what was lost between man and God and like what happened in the Garden of Eden. It's also to restore the kingdom of God on earth. Matthew 6.10 simply reads, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means God wants to bring his culture, his uh, culture's heaven, his kingdom to earth. And he wants as many people to accept that invitation as possible. He wants to conform people to his image and his likeness, his holiness. But guys, and what does this really even look like? If we look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23, it really looks like the fruit of the spirit. It means living with love, living with joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness goodness and faithfulness self-control those things those those amazing things guys the kingdom of darkness has none of these things it it <laughs> there's it literally says that there will be wailing and gnashing of the teeth for the kingdom of darkness there's going to be no rest but no not 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 the kingdom of heaven i have a i have a question because what do you think is going on like in heaven right now i tell you what, a lot of praising and singing guys Angels are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Every inhabitant in heaven is an eternal joy, an eternal bliss, an eternal peace. They have happiness. There's no tears in heaven, y'all. There's no tears in heaven. God is being worshipped for who he is. And there's nothing but laughter and benevolence in heaven. God sent Jesus to die for your sins that you can experience this. But most importantly, he did it so that he can be glorified. Guys, it's all about bringing him praise, honor, and glory on earth and in heaven. <sighs> yes, because there, there's a lot in it for us. There's really a lot in it for us, spiritual and, and um, physical blessings. But we are created to give God all the glory because of how awesome he is. Just imagine like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen like on this earth, even the most beautiful thing you can imagine. God transcends that beauty infinite times over. Like that that's that's why we worship God because he's an awesome God and he's and he's beautiful and he's lovely. But see the order is that you love him first regardless of what he can give you, regardless of what blessings he can give you, all that stuff. It's about loving him for who and what he is and also for what he's done. Matthew 6.33 reads, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The devotion to him comes before.
for the blessings, my friends. There's definitely an order. My pastor says it best. I love it when he says that um, God's not looking for gold diggers. It, it it's so true. And that that's that's literally yeah. People just kind of like you know want God to be like their genie or just you know just want them to just to be their sugar daddies. I guess I don't know, <laughs> but but yeah, he he wants your heart to be absolutely submitted to Him, and he wants you to turn away from your sins and accept his life of power and victory. Now, he wants you to be led by his Holy Spirit. And I, I love this other quote from my pastor too. He says that God is not looking for just more servants. You know, if he wanted more service, he would have just made more angels. But like I said before, he wants to restore that relationship that was lost between, you know, God and man. You know, Adam and Eve, they had that that intimate relationship with God. They, you know, they walked in a cool of the day with God. That's what God wants. He wants that restored as well. And guys, that's what the key, that's what the plan of the kingdom of God is. Uh, the role of us as followers, the role of his followers is to share this good news with all the nations. We see this, it's called the Great Commission. We see this in Matthew, what is it? 28, 16 through 20. It's about sending people to preach this message to worship Jesus, repent of your sins, and accept the invitation to heaven. And specifically, we have to repent of the sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve. And it's the desire to be our own gods, the desire to be our own rulers, our own kings. You remember that Aleister Crawley quote that I mentioned earlier, do as thou wilt? Yeah, well, we have to repent of do as thou wilt. We, we have to put him back on the throne when we're born into this world we're born automatically just wanting him off the throne of our lives we have to repent of that and allow him to be that man on the throne in our lives if you will um when you think about kings like god is king jesus is king when you think about that and you think about an actual king a king has order over his kingdom a, a king is revered he's he's honored he's royal royalty he's he he, he is, has ultimate authority over everything he reigns over and that's how we are to that's how we hard are, are to let jesus reign over our lives that's how we are to worship him that's how we are to reverence him um and i'm not saying that this is easy it's, it's really not it's, it's not just naturally it's not that easy to be submitted like that there is a cost but it's absolutely worth it and there's so many abundant blessings that 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 come with it and just by the fact that you're on a winning side first peter 1 3 through 5 reads praise be to the god the father of our lord jesus christ in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Jesus' followers spend eternity eternity with God in paradise with an inheritance that can never be stolen or it can never rot there will be like I said earlier there will be no sadness only joy happiness and bliss who doesn't want that man who really doesn't want that you know we'll be worshiping God for I mean forever because he's worthy he's worth it he's good and also you know in the meantime we have amazing blessings here on earth as well I'm going to run through these blessings really fast. John 16, 33 says, In Christ, we will have peace. And, and though we will have tribulations on earth, Jesus says, take heart, because he has overcome the earth. He's overcome the world. Ephesians 1, 3 says that the Lord Jesus has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Ephesians 3, 20 says that God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. Matthew 7:11 tells us to imagine the gifts that God can give us if we ask. Romans 8:28 says that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purposes. Hebrews 13:5 says that the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 8:18 8, says that the Lord gives us the power to obtain wealth 
John 10.10 10 says that Jesus came to give us life more abundantly. Hebrews 11.6 says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Guys, God provides all the resources to fulfill the Great Commission and also to live a very joyful and abundant life. The plan of the kingdom of God in these last days, that, that is the plan of the kingdom of God. God wants you to be actively involved in spreading this message and to spreading the good news and letting people know that they must count the cost, but know that God is worth it. He is good. And there is an eternity of blessings waiting for them. Guys, this is Christianity. This is the real Christianity. Now, now it's time to actually conclude with the ultimatum portion of this message. Now, I believe I was supposed to share the battle of the two kingdoms and, and go over the roles of each. I believe I was supposed to do that because it's time for like some people to really make a choice. You know, some some people have been straddling between the two kingdoms. Uh, some people just needed the gospel to be spelt out in a more tangible way. And some people have been leaning in a certain direction, but they just haven't made a choice. But now it's next time to decide. The time of salvation is now. That's Second uh, Corinthians 6, 2. Choose the right side. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And now you definitely know how the story ends. And if you watch this video to the end, you can you are now accountable for pretty much which side you're going to choose. You know exactly what you're getting into, whichever side you do choose. And even for people that call themselves Christians, this also applies to you too as well. Guys, please, I encourage you, share this message. Don't don't just let it don't just let it sit here for yourself. And also for those that call themselves Christians, make sure you're not lukewarm. Make sure you're not ended up like the latest sea in church. You know, um, because God is going to eventually separate the wheat and the tares. So that's just very, very important. Yeah, guys, in these last days, definitely don't be in that percentage of the elect that are going to be deceived. That's very important. But yeah, know where you stand, pick the winning side. I'll leave you with one last verse. One last verse that kind of like wraps and solidifies this whole thing together. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life so that both you and your descendants may live. God bless y'all, man. Really, I, I love y'all. And whoever this word is for, I pray that you really make the right choice and really choose the winning side. And again, I encourage you to share this video. I, I don't know who it's for, but you know, it was a very exhausting process when God gave it to me. Like I was, when he was downloading to me, I'm just like, wow, this is a lot to write out. But yeah, I know I was supposed to do it the way I did it. I know I was supposed to do it all at once, but yeah, thanks for bearing with me. God is good. We got it done. Like I said, I love y'all. I'll see y'all next week. Peace out.